thought they were extinct. They're back. Mutated and far more dangerous. Now they were here back. Only one man with mammoth firepower and a taste for big key can make dinosaurs extinct again. Turok, Dinosaur Hunter. What's up, people of the internet? Welcome to the Razor Grid Presents. Well, let's start with a little history lesson, shall we? In 1954, the world was introduced to a Native American warrior who found himself lost in a cave for an unknown amount of time until he reached the other side and discovered that dinosaurs still exist. And he has quickly come to realize he's much lower on the food chain than he originally thought. Originally, the story was put out by Western Publishing and Dell Comics, and later Gold Key Comics, and it wasn't until the early 90s that Valiant Comics revived the series where I first discovered it. Game publishers Acclaim and developers Iguana acquired the rights and began developing on the game in 1996. Turok was presented as a first-person shooter and released on the N64 on January of 97. I still remember watching the commercial for it, and it, it just blew my mind. I got it for Christmas that year and immediately became a fan of Tal Set and his quest to bring justice back to the Lost Lands. While portal jumping from level to level, you must obtain pieces of a weapon called the Chrono Scepter in order to defeat the Campaigner, a warlord and tyrant and all-around bad dude. The score was composed by Darren Mitchell, a musician out of Texas and the primary composer of Iguana Entertainment. Mitchell provided a great score of tribal-inspired music for the game, ranging from minimal drums and synths to more upbeat pieces to amp up the action. I particularly love the boss themes, but let's talk more Turok. Yeah, I went there, sorry. The Razor Grid presents Turok, Dinosaur Hunter.
Early in its development, the team at Iguana wanted to present a game that would take advantage of the N64's graphical power. Side-scrolling was becoming a thing of the past, so they decided on the third-person perspective, which definitely would have made it feel much different. Eventually, it became a first-person shooter. Considering how violent and action-oriented it was, developers were worried about what Nintendo was willing to allow on their console. Surprisingly, the Big N never asked to see what they had been making and never provided guidelines or limitations. In addition to its presentation, the game also used real-time lighting effects and used particle effects that added to the realism uh, of the game. Acclaim also had a motion capture studio that allowed Iguana to get reference material for enemy movement and even used emus for the dinosaurs. Now, all this may sound relatively normal by today's standards, but you gotta remember, this is 95, 96, so this was a much bigger deal then. But more on the next break.
at the time, the Nintendo 64 actually had greater processing power than most at-home PCs, which allowed developers the ability to do so much more. But as with any console of those eras, there was obviously going to be limitations. As a kid, though, I was around maybe 12 at the time. This game looked, felt, and sounded like paradise. I had never played anything that beautiful. I was seriously in awe every every time I popped the cartridge in. The box art alone was fantastic, with a Turok about to plunge his knife into a raptor's face while the raptor was swiping at his side, leaving bloody gashes. It was pretty epic. For those who bought the game new, might also remember that it came with its own mini-comic following Tal Set and warrior in training Joshua Fireseed. Although there were some mighty powerful weaponry in the game, I instantly fell in love with the tech bow. And my favorite memories always involve discovering hidden caves and paths, killing cyber raptors, and of course going toe to toe with the Technosaurus Rex. Still, after all these years, I consider it to be not only one of my favorite boss fights in a first person shooter, but also one of my favorite monsters. Also, I quickly want to mention the cheat code that even my dad found kind of fascinating, but it was one that let you play the game in simple black and white wireframe. When the hell do you ever see that?
On arrival, Turok was a success and garnered high praise from critics and had also scored highly on many game sites and magazines. Reviews praised the gameplay, graphics, and developer Iguana's ability to create superior games for the system. Some publications, however, would go on to say the game brought nothing new to the first-person shooter genre or kept comparing it to other shooter offerings of the time. Um, there weren't many fans of the game's War Fog, more commonly known as Distance Fog, used to reduce slowdowns in the game. Despite this, Turok went on to sell 1.5 million units. The franchise spawned a trilogy including a standalone multiplayer game, all within the span of the N64's life cycle. Even as late as 2016, a full two decades later, Night Dive Studios remastered Turok Dinosaur Hunter and its sequel, Seeds of Evil. Guys, thanks again for listening and taking this trip with me, and stay tuned while I follow up with the bigger, louder, and even bloodier sequel to Rock 2, Seeds of Evil. I'll see you then.